evening. Uh, to be amongst the last speakers is always a challenge. Uh, you know, you're caught between the drink and some more one-way conversations. Uh, my ideas are quite simple out here. Uh, the country is going through a crisis as never before. Uh, the rupee you're talking about, 70, if it settles at 70, I'm still happy. I don't know where it's going to, <laughs> going to go. Uh, there is a leadership vacuum, there's a decision vacuum, and uh, what I believe is a perfect storm is in making. Uh, the difference between the last perfect storms and this perfect storm is slightly different. The, the previous perfect storms, we caught us unawares, and therefore we had no choice but to uh, deal with it. And anything which comes as a surprise is a certain shock, and therefore you deal with it because you didn't expect it, you were not prepared for it, and it suddenly comes and you start dealing with it. Uh, this perfect storm is our making of our own making. Now, what is very clear in our mind is that the perfect storm which is forming, we will not be able to do anything about it. We can talk about it, we can wish about it, we can debate on televisions about what somebody else needs to be done, but what is very clear is uh, nobody's going to do anything about it. And therefore, if perfect storm is a reality, what do you as business people uh, or educationist or any, any business you are in or anything you're doing, what do you do about it? Uh, and in my book, uh, any time there is a bend in the world, any time there is a change, uh, that's not a threat, it's an opportunity. Uh, and the reason it is an opportunity is because a lot of people will freeze in action, uh, will not do anything, and they will waste a lot of time uh, prompting others to act. And in that prompting others to act, they will waste a lot of time and resources which they could have actually used in internalizing uh, and realizing that there is nothing going to change and therefore, uh, you know, you need to bring about a change. Some companies and some individuals will see this as an opportunity and the opportunity is not just in the challenge in the environment, it is also in the inaction of your competition or inaction of, uh, or lack of action of your competition. Now, how do you therefore lead in turbulent times? Uh, how do you think in turbulent times? How do you build a leadership pipeline in turbulent times and how do you grow faster in turbulent times than you would have grown in normal times. Uh, can it happen? Of course it can happen, and at HCL we've demonstrated that it did happen. But the more important question is how, how do you make it happen? And I think uh, a series of experiments which you know, we've conducted over the last eight years uh, appear to give us some insights in terms of how it can be done. Uh, before I go into that territory of how it can be done, one disclaimer is that these are a series of experiments. Uh, I'm not a professor and therefore I've not done any research. Uh, I'm a practitioner and therefore the, the ideas which I share with you work for us. But for every one idea which worked, there were 10 which did not work. And therefore, in hindsight, uh, I may try and put these together in very nice sounding vocabulary, but in foresight, uh, it was very confusing. Uh, so the first is creating the need for change. I think one of the biggest factor uh, in any organization is lack of appetite for change. And that is true with our country. Uh, one of the reasons we as a country are unwilling to change is we are not unhappy enough. Uh, when Gandhi came to our shores and talked about independence first, a lot of people told him that we are happy under the British Raj and why should we change? And it took him years and years, along with him, many other leaders, years and years to convince the Indian population that you should be free and you can be free. Unless that desire and hunger of change was created by creating dissatisfaction with status quo, the country was not ready for change. And our country is not ready for change because yes, there is pain, but I don't think the pain is widespread enough and painful enough for people to really give a decisive mandate, which I hope would be painful by 2014 for us to give a decisive mandate. Most organizations are in the business of selling how good they were or how good they are, rather than telling them there is a crisis. And therefore, instead of creating a burning platform, uh, they created what I call a safety net. And any change when you try and attempt in a safety net environment doesn't happen. So your first action has to be create a burning platform let everybody be aware in the organization that there is a crisis, the crisis could potentially turn into a disaster, and therefore the need for action internally is very, very strong. The second step is to create a romance for tomorrow. What is the art of possibility? The reason in college we chase girls and boys and you know 
to, to crazy extents and you know romance is very big is because there is a possibility of marriage and marriage in college looks real, looks very, very great. It's only once you get married you know what real <laughs> reality is. But at that particular time it really looks like a dream which you really want to chase and that's exactly what you want and for that you would do anything. You will stand on a tank, you will jump from you know wherever you are, you will run across the field naked, whatever needs to be done to try and get the girl or the boy, you would, you would do that. And the reason you do that is the romance of the future is so compelling and so inviting that you will jump up from your bed and go and work for that idea. So what is that idea of tomorrow for India? What is that idea of tomorrow for your organization? What is the idea of tomorrow for your teams? Uh, in most of the cases we don't. In most of the cases we keep telling our people that you know what, uh, you need to be proud of the fact you're Indian. Why? Uh, you need to be proud of the fact that you belong to my organization or my team or you're working with me. Why? Nobody has an answer of why but you need to be proud and in that conversation we lose out of the fact that the real reason anybody will jump out of the bed and work hard for you is one, he's unhappy, number two, there is a romance of tomorrow and there's a possibility uh, of gold at the end of the tunnel which is not finance, which is, which is something bigger. And we don't have that dream and in that dream we don't have the answer in terms of what is in it for you. What is in it for the organization is clear, what is in it for me is clear but what is in it for you is not clear. So once we have the dissatisfaction, the problem to fix and we have the romance of tomorrow and then it's a series of experiments going from here to there. At HCL in 2005 when we were at this crossroad exactly like we are on a crossroad all over again right now. Uh, in terms of the fact that what do we do, the crisis was looming, we were losing market share, mind share, talent share. Uh, interesting idea came to us and that we learned from the Japanese of the fact that the innovation is not necessarily in products. So Monbir Sani was talking about products and products. I don't seem to agree with, with his line of thinking. Uh, product innovation is one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, it is a high probability game. Uh, it's a low probability game of success and some people do extremely well and they are celebrated but for every one person who succeeds there are hundred who fail. And therefore when you are running a large corporation where you have lots of employees and lots of shareholders your ability to take risk at that juncture is substantially lower than your ability to take a risk at a, as, as a startup. Now as, as if you are running an organization and at that juncture you want to transform you can either innovate on the products you provide to the market and there is very li little innovation possible especially in crisis scenarios like today or possibly you can innovate on how you run the company. The Japanese actually manufactured similar cars if not the same cars as the Americans but they changed the methodology of manufacturing the car and therefore they brought in process of manufacturing so they changed the way they run the company and actually didn't, didn't produce new cars or new you know, cars would have fantastic features but they actually changed the process, changed the culture of manufacturing car which formally got adopted acro all across the world. So we started thinking in terms of is the innovation only in the product or is in the innovation on how you run the company. And the employee first, customer second idea was born out of three questions. The question number one is what is the core business we are in? And we said we are in the core business of creating incremental value for our customers which our competitors cannot create. Second question, where does this incremental value really get created? And in our business, which is services business, it gets created in the interface of our customers and our employees. That's the value zone. Hence the third and the fundamental question, if we are in the business of creating incremental value, differentiated value, and our employees in that interface are the people who are creating the differentiated value, what should the business of managers and management be? And the answer was quite obvious and simple that the business of managers and management should be to enthuse, encourage, enable those employees to create the differentiated value. And that is the reason the business of managers and management has to be employees first, customer second. Now that was the easy part, right? The easy part is to come to a logical conclusion that if you really want to transform your organization on the how axis, uh, you can go through these three series of questions and come to a conclusion that you need to reinvent management, you need to invert the pyramid, you need to do something radically different so that the organization structures are aligned to what you really want to do. The difficult part is doing. So 
we did a lot of experiments because we were convinced that the how axis had the innovative competitive differentiator, not the what axis. And therefore, if we could culturally transform our organization, today it is 90,000 people, if we could culturally transform our organization and create a competitive advantage on culture, on how we run a company, then it will be a competitive barrier for others to catch us for time immemorial. So it will be very difficult for them to catch up as long as we keep on innovating. So the question is, how do you do it? Now, for that you have to read my book, but, but in, in three parts, it is three steps. Number one, you need to build a level of trust with your employees. Today the employees, the citizens don't trust the leaders. And you use the word politician and we have huge distrust. Is it fair? I don't think it is fair. There are lots of extremely good politicians. But the trust is gone because of the behavior of a few politicians. Same is true with leadership. Do you trust the leadership in the companies you work with? I don't think so. Why? Because of the behavior of a few leaders or some leaders in the organization. So the trust is poor and unless you fix the trust, you are not able to get anywhere. So the question we debated is how do you fix the trust? We believe that by pushing the envelope of transparency, you can fix the trust. The right to education, right to information was a fantastic move gone wrong but a fantastic move to try and build the transparency and therefore build high credibility with the governance structures. Similar methodology we were adopted and many, many initiatives were done by pushing the animal of transparency, by sharing information of what is broken in the company and not what is good in the company, we started creating trust with our employees. The second was invert the organization pyramid. It was very important that the enabling functions which were supposed to enable actually start disabling because they become a citadel of power themselves. So HR, finance, quality, uh, audit, all these, comp all these functions which were supposed to enable the employee to create the value uh, suddenly become control functions because they are trying to convince the management that if they are not controlling, then the employees are going to run away with some amount of money. And that amount of thinking, when it, when, when it captures the imagination of the management, suddenly disables the whole organization. So we said we need these guys to continue to, to demonstrate that they can control what needs to be controlled, but at the same time we need a higher accountability. And therefore we inverted the pyramid and brought in systems and processes where the accountability of HR finance was also equally in the hands of the employees. The third was invert the organization pyramid for the management. So we inverted and made the management accountable to the employees. So my appraisal was actually done uh, by 90,000 employees now and the results were published on the web for everybody to see. And that is true with 6,500 of my colleagues in the organization. So by inverting the organization and making the management accountable to the employee, we started, started achieving the results which we were really seeking, that the individual who was facing off with the customer start really getting empowered. And, and, the, and, the, and the things started turning. But the last bit of the steps was, the, I think, the most important. Transfer the ownership of change to the employee. In the end, we didn't want to build a soft organization. We wanted to build a high-performance organization. So in the first three steps, what we did was we did everything which the employee wanted to be able to perform. And the fourth step was perform. And therefore, we said transfer the ownership of change. So therefore, the question in the company was not about, you know, did, we, did you perform or not? The question was, why did you not perform? And if he gave a reason or she gave a reason why she didn't perform, then the question was, did you ask your manager for help before you did not perform? And the question started becoming into proactiveness responsibility was in the hands of the employee. So whatever resources help you need to be able to meet your goals, you should be able to ask them in advance. And if that was not given to you, then tell, tell us and that would be accepted excuse, otherwise there is no excuse. So the excuse culture of lack of performance completely went away. And therefore we had a series of employees who were empowered, who were enabled, who were charged, and who had a vision for tomorrow, who were unhappy with today, who exactly know what needs to be fixed. And they started running a race which was faster and faster and faster. So what was the results? The result was from $750 million, we went to $4.5 billion. We grew about 600% in revenue, profit, market cap, employee satisfaction in, in any, any terms which you see. And it, it was you know, one, of the, one of the most celebrated transformation stories which the world has seen, which, which, which 
deals with a huge amount of employees without any innovation on products and services. And that, that is very important. So I end my story out here with only one thought to leave behind with you. The country is going through a huge amount of crisis. I am not sure whether we have the leaders who are going to take the responsibility of turning it around. Let it be. It, it's, it's fine. The question we need to ask is what are you doing about it? What is that extra step you have taken today which is going to yield results? What are you doing about it? If a billion Indians start asking that question of what am I doing about it, I think we will stop worrying about what somebody else is doing about it. And that is the whole philosophy around employee first, customer second. In every organization, employees are waiting for management to do something about it. In HCL, the question is, what is the employee doing today about today's problem? And when it becomes a billion employees or a million employees, the organization suddenly starts performing at a completely different clock speed than we are used to. Thank you. And